Good evening, everyone. I guess you're used to not being able to enjoy your dinner uh, by now. I think you're almost done with, the, with this uh, wonderful event. So I think you've been learning about performance debuggers today. Is that correct? And, and other things. You don't look like people who, had, who would have bugs in your program, so I'm not sure why. <laughs> why. Not necessary for you. But anyway, I'm, I'm going to talk about something completely different. Uh, coding the continuum, and I'll explain to you what I mean by that as we go forward. Um, so you, you've mostly been uh, talking, I guess, over the last few days uh, or week and a half about uh, you know, the products of a remarkable 40 years or more of uh, improvements in uh, computing, which is, what, nine orders of magnitude uh, improvement in the last 40 years or 39 years, um, adding another order of magnitude uh, in about 18 months or so, once Aurora uh, appears. Um, I, I'm going to be talking more about uh, something else, which is uh, really an equally remarkable set of improvements that have occurred during uh, the, the same period um, in uh, wide area networking. So, uh, you know, when computing started, uh, well, let's say 40 years ago, which of course is long after computing started, but back then when people were accessing Cray 1 computers, they were doing it actually not 10 to the fourth bits per second, but 9,600 bits per second, typically, a dial-up line, uh, which was not a particularly useful way of uh, doing remote things, although it seemed uh, amazing at the time, um, I think. I remember that very vaguely. Uh, and now uh, we're you know, deploying 100 gigabit per second networks, uh, getting up experimental 400 gigabit per second networks, uh, we'll say more about uh, future developments uh, in a second. Uh, and interestingly, uh, unlike uh, computers, which are you know, running into Moore's law uh, limits uh, on their performance, um, network networking seems to continue to uh, improve. So that's a pretty exciting um, set of developments. So back some uh, 20 years ago, uh, there was a rather eccentric fellow called George Gilder. Has anyone ever heard of him? He's quite a... You could look him up, he's an odd fellow. But back then, he was an uh, enthusiast for wide area networks. So this was just about the time when optical networks were starting to be quite widely deployed, 155 megabits per second, even 622 megabits per second. And, and he uh, observed um, that uh, the speed of some of these networks was pretty much as fast as the internal links of some of the uh, computers of the day. And he made this rather odd uh, statement. Um, when the network is as fast as a computer's internal links, the machine disintegrates across the net into a set of special purpose appliances. And uh, I found that interesting at the time, and I'm going to sort of use it as a theme for uh, my talk tonight. So let's first of all talk about what he meant by that, and then uh, talk about perhaps some of its implications. So, you know, first of all, the network is as fast as the uh, computer's internal links. Well, I won't go into the details of how uh, internal and wide area networks have changed the performance over the years, but I did note that there's been a continued exponential growth, certainly in uh, network performance, and that, that uh, actually seems uh, to be continuing to uh, develop uh, quite rapidly. So there's sort of a neat uh, plot in the upper left here, which is, uh, I haven't, haven't seen this before until I put the slides together for this talk. It, it, it looks at communication technologies in terms of uh, bandwidth bits per second uh, times the number of kilometers in between uh, uh, the points where you need to uh, replicate the signal. So, and that's continued to increase uh, exponentially and actually more rapidly uh, well, since the 1940s, apparently, 1840s apparently, uh, when the very first experiments with telegraphs uh, appeared and have continued to increase yet more rapidly today. Um, we've got 5G being deployed. Uh, so communication, high-speed communications are becoming uh, ubiquitous, at least within uh, built-up areas. And, and I like the next, the next thing on the right uh, a, a lot more. So most people, we learn the speed of light, um, uh, at least the speed of light and fiber, uh, which is what matters to most of us. But mostly, that's the speed of light in glass. Uh, and people are starting, at least in the lab, to create uh, fibers which are hollow. So you get the light going 46% uh, uh, times faster because they're running inside uh, through air rather than through fiber. 
and you may wonder why that matters. Well, you know, I originally come from New Zealand, so that move, moves New Zealand several uh, tens of milliseconds closer uh, that, than, than it is at the moment. Um, so anyway, ubiquitous uh, high-speed networking as fast as the computer's internal links. So you might think that means you know, we can compute anywhere. So we don't need to compute on our desktop. Uh, we can compute somewhere else where it's cheaper, uh, nearer to our data, you know, where we're greenest, the, the most uh, environmentally friendly source. Um, all sounds very exciting. But there are, of course, uh, some limits on um, what it means to be free from uh, communication costs because uh, we still have to worry about latency, right? So uh, I can compute somewhere else, uh, but I've got to allow for the time to get um, a signal to the remote location and back. So if we think of ourselves as being in a, a sort of a, a three-dimensional space in which distance is in one direction uh, and uh, costs are in another direction, the further we go away, the higher the costs. We're sort of stuck in this valley of uh, um, where, where uh, it gets very expensive, perhaps in terms of latency, uh, to compute uh, elsewhere. So why would we ever want to compute on a remote computer? Well, this is where uh, you know George Gilder's other statement comes in. He 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 uh, also uh, you know observed that not only can we compute elsewhere, but an inevitable, an, an inevitable consequence of that is that our computers are going to become more specialized in, in various ways. Um, and so let's look into why he might have uh, uh, said that. Well, the first set of observations relate not to um, anything I think he was thinking about back then, and that is the fact that we are getting more and more specialized computer systems. And, and that's more a result of Moore's law uh, breaking down, I think, than, uh, than anything relating to, uh, to high-speed communications, although we'll come to that in a second. But so, you know, we, as probably most of you know, and you've probably been hearing in the last few, uh, few uh, days, you know, we, CPUs, which for a long time we just assumed would get double in performance every uh, 18 months or so, um, no longer are doing so, but we can, we, or we can, or we in fact have to turn to other sorts of devices if we want to get faster computers. We turn to many core CPUs, to GPUs, maybe to FPGAs, you know, um, and even to, in some cases, to custom uh, uh, circuits. Uh, and by doing so, we can get orders of magnitude improvements in performance over our regular CPU. Um, this is something that used to be mostly uh, uh, the, you know, what academics played with, you know, programming algorithms that run okay on, FPG on CPUs and getting them running faster on FPGAs. But uh, the emergence, first of all, of GPUs and now of uh, AI applications mean that we're seeing this explosion, you know, a Cambrian explosion, if you like, of, uh, of CPU types. So, uh, you know, this is a fairly somewhat out-of-date slide, but it's, uh, these are all companies that are manufacturing various forms of accelerators for AI, for particular and AI turns out just to be matrix multiplication. Um, who knew? Um, so basically what supercomputers have been used for for, for, for decades. But these people are all building uh, chips uh, that are designed to accelerate the deep neural networks that are fundamental to, to AI. So that's one way in which we're getting specialization. But uh, you know, another equally important, of course, is uh, the emergence of cloud computing. So I don't no, if George, I think George Gordo was aware of this when he made his, uh, his uh, comment. He was actually an early proponent of cloud computing systems. Uh, so the following comment is somewhat, can be argued, but uh, you know, cloud computing, says James Hamilton, who's a very smart fellow who's worked at Microsoft and Amazon and elsewhere, you know, gives you a five to ten times improved price point relative to uh, enterprise uh, deployments, you know, whatever you'd find in your typical bank or, or, or business. Um, last time I used that slide, someone said that's ridiculous because, of course, I can buy a terabyte, a terabyte drive for $100 and, and stick my data on it, but that's not the point. You know, a storage service or a compute service has many other features besides its mere uh, capacity. So anyway, we are seeing, uh, as, as I think you probably all know well, um, you know, hyper da hyperscale data centers, which are offering tremendous economies of scale relative to computing 
deployed uh, within an individual uh, office or home, even modular data centers which are being deployed in interesting areas, something that we might uh, come back to if we have time. So that's pretty interesting. One, one other thing I'll just throw up here, um, just because I, I find it a fun project. This is a, a colleague of mine at the University of Chicago, Andrew Chen, uh, has a project called Zero Carbon Cloud. Um, so this is an interesting thing which you may not be aware of. So if you uh, run, uh, deploy an alternat alternative energy power plant, like a solar panel uh, array or a, a set of um, windmills, they basically generate power all the time that they're turned on. Uh, and of course, most of the time, you hope that that power will be consumed by the electric power grid. But if the electric power grid doesn't want it, you've got something called stranded power, and you can't necessarily just turn your windmill off. Uh, a problem, what do you do with that stranded power? In some cases, they actually pay the power grid to take their power from them. Um, in other cases, says Andrew Chen, well, why don't we just run little modular data centers uh, wherever we have this basically free electricity, and perhaps they'll even pay us to take the electricity, which is a pretty uh, interesting idea. So lots of interesting opportunities for optimization. So uh, getting back to the theme of this talk, um, I showed you a picture of a performance landscape. You know, we're stuck in this valley and everywhere, everywhere else is more expensive. But when we take into account this uh, rise of specialization, then the performance landscape becomes a bit peculiar, right? It's sort of foggy and, and uh, oddly shaped. Um, you know, for example, you know, we've got a program that can run on two computers. Uh, on one, it runs in uh, 10 uh, milliseconds. The other, it runs in five milliseconds, which is faster. Sort of a trick question, you might think, well, it is. But the answer, of course, depends on their location, right? So if, um, if the uh, C1 is right next to me, I can access it instantly. I can, so it takes 10 milliseconds to run my problem. If the other one is 500 kilometers away, um, that uh, will take me 50 milliseconds, uh, sorry, whatever it is, um, 2.5 milliseconds to get there, 2.5 milliseconds to get back, uh, and uh, 5 plus 2.5 plus 2.5 is 10, so it also takes 10 milliseconds. So in a sense, uh, you know, the apparent speed of a computer if I'm just observing how long it takes to do something, depends on its location, and the apparent location depends on its speed. So you know, we've got started to get this strange uh, sort of trade-off between location and, and, uh, perf and, uh, and performance. And that's what I'm going to probe on a little bit uh, right now. And so let me introduce now the word uh, continuum. So continuum, uh, what is a continuum? Um, it's, I won't do it, some of test. It's, uh, a set of elements such that between any two of them there is a third element, so a continuous space. Um, this term has been used in computing in the following way uh, to refer to the fact that we're increasingly get, getting devices that range from the very small to the very large. Uh, Pete Beckman put together this uh, picture, I believe, um, and he uh, you know, further uh, hypothesizes that um, uh, both the cost and the number of these devices uh, scale uh, with, with size in, in some uh, continuous sense. So the very small uh, little devices, you know, the Adafruit or Trinket uh, devices might cost $5 and there are uh, uh, billions of them. And, and then a supercomputer might cost $1,000 million. Uh, $1, million. Um, you know, the big computers like Aurora and, uh, are approaching that point. And perhaps uh, there's uh, only one of those uh, or a small number of uh, them in the world. So that's actually relevant to our theme, but I'm, it's not the way in which I'm using the term continuum in this talk. I, I want to refer instead to a, a more uh, perhaps fundamental and older idea, that of the space-time continuum, which uh, you know, is a term that I believe was uh, coined by Herman, Herman Minkowski. He was a teacher of uh, Einstein's um, and uh, became famous perhaps, uh, among, perhaps among other things for uh, you know, coming up with a way of explaining uh, numerical uh, relativity uh, by, in terms of these uh, space-time diagrams, uh, pointing out that uh, you know, the speed of something uh, depends partly on, on, its, uh, on its location and, and, and vice versa. And so he formed these, uh, drew these pictures. This is in German because he was German. This is from his original talk, introducing it in 1908. And in this dimension, this is a one-dimensional uh, space dimension. 
This is uh, time in the other dimension, a 45 degree angle with something traveling at the speed of light. So something cannot travel um, above in this part of the, uh, the space, but you can be at various points here. So what's this got to do with uh, computational systems? Well, I, I think you can sort of adapt this picture um, to uh, talk about the relationship between speed and location in computation. So here's a picture that uh, captures uh, the example I just gave you, right? So here's my uh, little uh, slow computer that's right next door to me. It takes um, a, uh, what, 10 milliseconds to complete my task. Here's a, uh, uh, another uh, computer, the other computer which t can run the same problem in five milliseconds. It's uh, 500 kilometers or 2.5 milliseconds away uh, in fiber. Um, that is glass fiber, not holo, hollow fiber, um, and uh, 2.5 milliseconds back, and they have the same, the same performance. Um, so the behaviors of these two things are indistinguishable. Uh, so we could sort of paraphrase uh, Minkowski in some way, and if I was a better mathematician, I might try and do that more rigorously. You know, that location and speed are sort of uh, interchangeable and have to be understood uh, together. So I thought, I'd, let's give you a real example of what this looks like in practice. And this is actually what got me thinking about this in the first time, the first place. So uh, a group of uh, high-energy physicists at Fermilab, um, Nan Tran was the one I spoke to, but that's a, he's part of a larger team, were, uh, have been playing around with the use of FPGAs, you know, uh, field, programmable, field programmable gate arrays, uh, to uh, accelerate various trigger data analysis uh, applications. These are things that will take the data coming out of a high energy physics experiment, do something very fast uh, to filter out interesting events and then pass on the uh, interesting events. And these are of course very important because a thing like the Large Hadron Collider generates data at about, raw data at about a petabyte per second and you have to reduce that down quite a bit if you're going to do something useful with it. And he uh, explained that they don't actually have any FPGAs, at least they didn't back when I talked to them, at Fermilab. But that was okay, because they could use FPGAs in the uh, Amazon cloud. Um, the FPGAs there were uh, a thousand kilometers away, but they ran their problems uh, in, uh, what is it, uh, 20, uh, sorry, 30 milliseconds, rather than the two seconds required on their local computers. So allow for the 10 milliseconds to get there, the 10 milliseconds to get back, and you're still 40 times faster than a local CPU. So for them, it was actually much cheaper to compute remotely uh, than locally. So I, I think it would be uh, interesting uh, to start to think about how we might formalize the, some of these vague thoughts that I've expressed and you know, perhaps come up with some calculus for this computing uh, continuum. So you know, here's the following is just a few brief uh, ideas about how we might uh, you go out and do that. So you know, we might think about a computing demand space, first of all, and I'll assume that's uh, uniform. So uh, you know, N consumers distributed uniformly, they're all X seconds apart. You know, so that might be, uh, you know, if it's a millisecond, what that's uh, 20, uh, or 10th of a millisecond, I think is, um, or a hundredth of a millisecond is two kilometers. So maybe they're a hundredth of a millisecond apart, nice continuous space. Uh, each of them is, because we're trying to come up with a very simple model, is requesting compute units regularly, once per second. Uh, we have infinite bandwidth, so we just have to worry about latency. And an individual computer uh, takes uh, some amount of time, say t seconds, to compute, uh, to perform a compute unit. Um, and then we've got compute centers. We're going to create compute centers, so where do we want to create them? Um, and I'm going to make this assumption that uh, if you uh, have more computers in one place, then it's going to be faster. So why would that be? Well, economies of scale. Uh, perhaps you can have faster computers. You can have more specialized devices. Of course, we can argue infinitely about what that scaling factor should be and if it's real, but I think it is there. Um, interestingly, this number that I just sort of picked because the, it made the math easier than assuming it scaled with the log of z. Uh, turns out back in 1953, a, a fellow called um, Grosch uh, postulated what he called Grosch's law, that compute power rises by the square of the price of a computer, which, uh, well, whether, is it true or not? Um, back then, he used it to make the argument which many of you have, may have heard that 
the world would only need five computers. And that because they said, well, there's such benefits to centralization uh, that, we're, that you want a small number of them. Um, turns out we do have just five computers in some sense. We've got Amazon, Microsoft, uh, and <laughs> plus Aurora and Summit, of course. Uh, so uh, yeah. Um, but anyway, so let's see what happens if we uh, try and uh, use uh, you know, some of the, this very simple model. You know, we can go through and say, uh, what is the maximum time uh, to, uh, what's the fastest we can, we can perform a computation uh, you know, across our uh, n computers? So you know, we can, a bit of math, we can say, assuming we're no response time bounds, well, on one computer, it's going to take t seconds to do our local uh, piece of work. On, uh, if we have n, our, if we have n, uh, a single center of n computers, it's t divided by square root of n, because we've got one very centralized, very fast system, uh, plus uh, the latency, which uh, Pythagoras's uh, theorem there tell, tells us what it is. And if we put in some real numbers, uh, it turns out I won't explain what the numbers are, but well, that's 100 computers, um, uh, 10 milliseconds of comp computation, and we assume that we're um, what, 20 kilometers, our consumers are 20 kilometers apart. It's uh, roughly uh, four times faster to use a single centralized uh, system. Um, so this is obviously a total, art, totally artificial thing, but it's interesting to me that we can start to reason about these things in some interesting way. Um, you know, similarly, if we have a response time bound, we might say, well, how big do we, what's the, what's the optimal uh, allocation? Uh, well. We have a response time bound of b uh, seconds. Um, you know, we know that within a circle, we've got pi d squared over x squared consumers. Uh, if they are uh, x, x units apart and our circle has uh, diameter, uh, sorry, radius d. I don't know why I called it d. It should be r, I suppose. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, so as our size is of this, as we then want to, uh, we, we know we want to know the d for which t divided by the square root of the number of consumers within that circle, plus two times the uh, radius uh, is uh, less than our bound. And we can go through and do that, and we can find out that for these particular assumptions, the optimal allocation is uh, one of these things every 1,000 kilometers or, or so. OK, so that's a, a few words about how we might go about modeling the computing uh, continuum. Um, and I think you know, a few things we learn from it. Assuming that we do get these economies of scale and economies of specialization, then uh, sort of obviously uh, we want to distribute function to centralized computing systems and aggregate capability. Uh, and I think that's something we all sort of know, but perhaps we're going to start to get a handle on how we might model uh, those things uh, in, in a practical setting. Now, to, get, to do better, we'd like to know things like, well, it would be nice to have some empirical data on how cost and speed scale with size. We'd like to know more. We might want to incorporate a more realistic model of data transfer costs and get some real data on, on workloads. And uh, these are all things that we're actually working on at, at Argonne and, and Chicago. And you know, we could clearly uh, quickly discover that there are going to be some things that are latency sensitive, uh, have latency bounds, others don't. And therefore, we're probably going to want some sort of uh, uh, distributed uh, continuum of computing devices, some at big specialized centers, some at little edge devices, and some in other places uh, in between. And uh, you know, there are some data available um, that we can start to look at. For example, this is some uh, DOE data on uh, data center server intensity, which is, I think it probably correlates pretty closely with uh, people intensity as well. Um, but still, it's interesting that there are some data. Uh, available. So um, I think we're, I'm going to continue on for a little while. So I've got, so that was one aspect of, one, one, one aspect of coding the continuum, uh, trying to create a model of it, uh, which I su suggest that we can perhaps do. Um, but uh, of course, another m version of that, uh, another meaning of that phrase is writing code for the continuum. So I'd like to say a few words about that as well, because that's what I'm uh, particularly interested in. So, you know, the question is, our machine has disintegrated across the net. You know, we've got different parts of it in different places, assuming that we've got problems like security uh, and so forth uh, solved. Uh, you know, what is, how do we go about 
coding something where our logic is running here, but then we end up wanting to reach out to, across to an FPGA device uh, a thousand kilometers away, or perhaps uh, you know another specialized device uh, uh, somewhere else. Um, and I, I think you know there's sort of five problems that we that we would see that we would face. Um, we need some sort of function fabric that will let us dispatch computational tasks to different places. We need a data fabric that will let us access data regardless of where we are. A trust fabric, very important, because uh, we, uh, of course, are going to be accessing devices of many different sorts owned by different uh, providers. And then, you know, very important also, we need some sort of cost map so that we can know where it makes sense to go to perform our computations. Initially, perhaps we know nothing. Over time, we want to build up a cost map, perhaps collaboratively with others, about how long our trigger analysis code will take to run in, in different places, uh, for example. So I thought I'd walk through a quick example, um, show you how some of these issues might arise. So this is an a, a application we're working on at Argon. This is a, uh, a device uh, for serial synchrotron crystallography. Um, I'll spend a couple of minutes explaining it. So crystallography, the basic idea is that you uh, crystallize a protein, uh, shoot it with x-rays, look at the resulting scatter patterns, and then back solve to find um, what the crystal actually is. And people have been doing remarkable things with this uh, technology over many years uh, you know, to crystallize, solving the structures for increasingly large uh, uh, and complex proteins. But an interesting uh, phenomenon is that uh, you can only, historically at least, could only do this for uh, when you're for proteins that you're able to crystallize. Um, so at least form large crystals of. So serial synchrotron crystallography uh, instead, um, and there are various, there are variants of it, but this particular one, you, you form lots of very little crystals. Um, you build these plates uh, which hold um, actually tens of thousands of these uh, crystals. Um, I think 26,000 is the, the, the version that, that uh, the group at Argon is working with. And then you zap each of these plates, one after the other, to collect data, each with a small crystal uh, in a different configuration. And then you take all of the data and uh, solve that much more complex inverse problem to uh, determine uh, the structure. And if you uh, look at this as sort of a computing problem, you're, uh, you're imaging crystals at about 50 hertz. Um, so you're getting an image every 20 milliseconds. Um, each of those is perhaps six megabytes, takes uh, five milliseconds. Um, and so let's say, well, let's say you've got five milliseconds to, uh, to image it. Um, you've got then, then after about a thousand images, then you want to do some quality control thing, which is now you're working on six gigabytes. Perhaps you've got about a second uh, to image that because you've got to be able to turn this around in, in a 15 second uh, time frame. And then you, uh, after a whole plate, you have another problem. And after you've done a whole plate, then you have to decide whether to move on to uh, another uh, plate or repeat the analysis with a new plate for the same crystal, or you can go on to a new, uh, a new protein. Um, so basically, you end up with a uh, set of uh, increasingly challenging computational problems with increasingly uh, actually looser uh, synchronization uh, con latency constraints. Um, so I won't go into the details of that, but it's sort of fun to think, well, assuming that we're going to spend 20% of our time in communication, uh, how far away can we uh, do these computations? Well, the first one, we, can only, we have to do it within 50 kilometers, uh, assuming speed of light transmission, uh, because otherwise the latency is too large. The second uh, computation, the green one here, well, that can be 10,000 kilometers away. Uh, we don't, I guess, have very good optical communication to the... Uh, to the moon, but the next one is uh, we can run as uh, 600,000 kilometers away, and so on and so forth. So the point is latency doesn't end up being a, as much a barrier to uh, running these uh, sorts of computations remotely as one might have thought. So we're doing a lot of this at Argon, actually, um, where we have actually quite nice latency environments. So the Argon Leadership Computing Facility, which you've heard a lot about this week, uh, that's it here. Have you visited? You did? Yeah. You may not have visited the advanced photon source, which is over here. Okay, you did. But it's a similar, it's also a $500 million uh, facility. 
and it's about uh, 10 uh, microseconds away. So that's how we like to think of it, a kilometer, in other words. Um, so uh, actually, round trip time. So we're, we can easily reach out from the APS to ALCF and as well as to other, other devices. Um, so, but these needs to, uh, so why, why did I sort of go through this example? Well, I wanted to use it as an example of an application in which instead of performing a single computation, you've got a, actually a series of computational tasks with of very different types, different data volumes, different uh, computational demands, uh, and different latency demands. And we're starting to see these sorts of uh, things arising uh, throughout science, uh, thanks to, in particular, to the emergence of AI-enabled science. So uh, you know, this is a picture I, I put together to sort of explain what I see the modern scientific computing infrastructure needing to be able to do. So it needs to support a whole range of AI methods of different sorts, you know, training models, uh, creating models from scratch, um, running hyperparameter optimization suites to configure models, running models, um, building surrogate models for computational uh, processes, ingesting data from different sources. Uh, and under the covers, we need an agile infrastructure that can provide on-demand computing to all these very different sorts of computational uh, activities. And, and here's one uh, that um, we've been uh, starting to work with. Um, one particular class of uh, AI integration into science, which I find uh, pretty exciting. So, so the concept here is that of a learned function accelerator, so, um, which I'll explain. So a lot of scientific codes uh, spend a lot of time basically calling the same function again and again. You know, if you're a uh, densely functional theory, uh, code in chemistry, you're calling something to tell you what a force field is between uh, two atoms. If you're a climate model, you're calling a function that computes the uh, you know, radiation uh, passage through, uh, through the atmosphere or, or the impact of clouds. And they do that by executing uh, you know, lots and lots of very detailed code that uh, compute to the best of uh, their abilities the, the known physics for that problem. But in some cases, uh, it's feasible to do that for a while, recording the uh, inputs and the outputs, and then use those inputs and outputs to train a deep neural network that will approximate the function. It's a surrogate function, or as you might call it, a learned function accelerator. And so you might then uh, you know, modify your codes to do things like the following. So if you can read this here, I'm sorry to show you code over dinner, but uh, you know, so you know, you've got uh, some uh, function here that says, um, you know, if uh, for this particular function, if you've got a learned function accelerator uh, for this function x, then run it. Otherwise, um, you know, go off and uh, compute the function and then update your uh, data uh, uh, archive until such time as you're ready to train the, the learned function. And you might inter inter intermingle your uh, calls to this uh, surrogate model with, uh, you know, checks to make sure that it's doing well and, and then uh, uh, retrain periodically. So, but, so the interesting thing about from a computing perspective is now instead of just simply sitting there running your function again and again, uh, you're going to be running all these different things. You've got a UQ, an uncertainty quantification engine, an inference engine which is running the deep neural network, and a training engine which is doing training, as well as something that's actually running your model. So we need much more complex uh, computing environments for, for that purpose, which, you know, might include all sorts of AI accelerators and, and such like. So how are we going to go about building a computing environment for this sort of uh, environment, for, this, for these sorts of workloads? Well, uh, you know, industry is actually hard at work on this. Um, so has anyone heard of Amazon Greengrass? Uh, sort of an interesting, so as you probably know, you know, the Amazon is, as like other cloud vendors, has a very uh, rich uh, environment of uh, uh, computing services that do things like run functions for you. They do function as a service. But of course, they're all a long way away. They're off in Virginia or uh, Seattle or wherever it may be. Uh, green grasses, the idea is that they, they're starting to put little uh, clusters in various places closer to people, increasing, including ones that may be located right next to your, your scientific instrument. Um, and then this so-called green grass sits there and sends your function calls to the right place. 
So if, at least if you're in banking, this is probably a pretty interesting thing to be doing. I don't think it's quite what we want to be using for science, at least uh, not for now. So, so we've been interested in, in building out a, uh, an open solution for this continuum coding uh, problem. Um, and you know, we, we view this as needing to include quite a few things, uh, technologies, I won't go quite in order, technologies for writing programs that will let us and maybe take Python and decorate certain functions and say, well, this is something that uh, can be executed remotely. You know, this is the thing that we might want to send off to a, uh, uh, an FPGA uh, array. Uh, we need methods for collecting performance data and building a cost map of what can run where uh, at what cost. Uh, we need mechanisms for uh, dispatching our functions to remote uh, locations, function as a service. Uh, we need underpinnings that will let us access data regardless. So if we get dispatched somewhere and we need some data, we can fetch it. Uh, and we can do that securely. That's our trust fabric. Uh, and then a few other things which I won't uh, uh, talk about. So if I had a, another hour, I would go through and explain each of those uh, things to you. But I think I won't do that because I, 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 I fear that you may not want to uh, be working on whatever you're doing next until midnight. I think you have other things planned at nine o'clock uh, or so. So let me, uh, I will skip over the slides that speak about these various uh, elements of uh, what we're doing, but you will be provided with the slides and they give you some uh, examples. But I'll just show you one, one here. This is uh, uh, show you how we're putting these things together in some interesting ways. So this is uh, uh, another advanced photon source application. Uh, this in this case is concerned with scanning uh, brain, mouse brains. This is another fascinating problem. Uh, Bobby Casturi and others want to, their goal is to image an entire um, mouse brain. So far they're focusing on a cubic millimeter, which I think generates about a petabyte of data if I remember correctly. Um, but they repeatedly scan little bits of it um, and then have this workflow to run where they uh, have a whole series of collecting data, pre-processing it, previewing it, uh, engaging users to validate results, reconstruct it, and so on and so forth. And, and we're building this as a series of uh, these uh, function as a service methods in this continuum, coding continuum, coding continuum model where uh, we find the right place to run different aspects of this workflow, dispatch uh, computations to it, some to uh, uh, you know, a Kubernetes cluster running at Argon, some to the Argon leadership computing facility, others to, to, to other lo locations. So uh, I think I will wrap up here. So let me, first of all, uh, say standard uh, thanks slide. Um, those are the people who've supported uh, the work. Um, and then back here, I forgot to say this, this is very bad. These are some of the people who are working on it. These are scientists at Argonne in Chicago. Um, they are actually, in both, they and others are working to implement all these pieces. And if you're interested in learning more about any of them, we should, uh, we should talk further. And then sort of a wrap up slide. Um, oh, actually, this, let me mention one more thing because I think it's sort of fun. So how do you build these cost maps? Um, fascinating question. Um, you know, so you've got an application, you want to uh, know where's the best place to run it. You've got, I guess in the continuum as a whole, you've got an infinite number of places to run it almost. Uh, in our, this case here, we've got different AWS, uh, Amazon Web Services instant types. And so you can use active learning techniques and transfer learning techniques to work out, given a large number of applications and a large number of places to run it, what experiments you should run in order to improve the quality of your model subject to uh, cost constraints. And I think interesting things to be, to be done there. OK, so final slide. So I took as my uh, you know, introductory uh, inspiration this remark by George Gilder, the machine disintegrating across the net into a special set of special purpose appliances. Seemed a rather odd thing to say, but turns out in essence, to be correct. I mean, that is what is happening uh, uh, today. The modern computing environment is increasingly decentralized in a funny way, uh, de or distributed, I should say, but also highly centralized, of course, thanks to commercial clouds, uh, supercomputing centers, uh, and so forth. Um, and so we then, we, but it's also increasingly specialized. So uh, 
we have accelerators of all sorts with many different capabilities. Um, and so uh, we therefore have this, these two interesting problems. One, how do we reason about the nature of this computing continuum? Um, you know, and I suggested a very simple performance model, which may or may not end up being useful. And then, uh, which I didn't, then the thing I didn't talk about is you know, some of the new programming uh, methods we might need to use in order to uh, code uh, these systems and build applications that can robustly distribute different components to different places, as I think we require for uh, new AI-enabled science applications uh, as well as others. So thank you very much.